there's been a few hundred years of a trajectory of change where a few elites starting in Europe dominated the rest of the world and then used technology to subjugate both nature and people. And it's a minority group of people. These people were not more highly evolved. They were simply using a tool of very narrow focus, a type of science that was very narrowly linked to profit and to control. And that tool and those technologies that came from that are not part of an evolution. They're actually part of a particular group of people exploiting the majority of humanity. And our blindness to this in part is that we've been told this is good for you. This is progress. This is evolution. Don't question it. Don't step back and say, wait a minute, maybe this is the wrong turn. If we don't recognize that this is a wrong turn, what are we saying? Are we really saying that we're going to want to have, uh, you know, a handful of men owning the entire world and the rest of humanity, no voice, nothing to say, no role to play, no creativity, no, no nothing? <laughs>
actually with about 45 different language groups that had translated our books and materials. And this worldwide localization day is something we decided to launch after COVID. Um, so you know, almost two years ago, because we had been doing conferences in various regions of the world where people were coming together face to face to discuss these choices we have, which path do we want to support into the future? And we had a very you know, helpful, broad picture based on a lot of global experience. And we're offering you know, this clarity about we really need to choose whether we want to support the continued globalization, which is the continued corporatization of our lives, of our democracies, of our world, or whether we want to start bringing power back to the people, to a democratic process, to communities. And that's what we're calling localization. So we, you know, we built up quite a lot of alliances and networks. And this year, about 70 groups on every continent put on events to reinforce this message and to strengthen and build the movement. Uh, and you know, very much from the bottom up, but it's also beginning now to uh, meet with a little bit less resistance from, from government, particularly at local government levels. And then we also had a program of organizing local food feasts. So our work has been about localization in general, but always with a strong focus on food. And within, you know, trying to make everyone aware that there's nothing else that humans produce that we all need every single day. And we have this tragic situation where blindness has allowed you know, both the grassroots and at higher levels, this process of separating us further and further from the sources of our food and building up a global food economy, which is the biggest contributor to climate change, mountains of plastic, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, which in turn contribute to cancer, high fructose corn syrup, processed food, which are responsible for diabetes and, and on and on. So. We, we had these local food feasts all over the world and they were, many of them were organized by people who sort of already had known about this. And, but we had just incredible gratitude uh, for planting these ideas and seeds. And yeah, it ended up being incredibly inspiring for us as well as for uh, lots and lots of people around the world. And then we also had, again, for the second year, we had Russell Brand support. And this year also Naomi Klein joined us. And we had, again, Brian Eno, who had made a, a special little video last year, make a statement of support. And um, yeah, we've had um, managed to get a few well-known figures to come out and really support this movement. I, I noticed that for sure. And I, I was going to mention that Russell Brand and you in the past, you've also worked with uh, Nana Shiva. You've had personal discussions with uh, Noam Chomsky as well. And Charles Eisenstein has been uh, supportive and, and on, on having discussions with you as well. So a lot of the, our world's thought leaders who are really um, voicing and, and giving some influence for the movement, I, I really loved seeing that. I partook uh, during the full month long as well, followed, enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, didn't have any uh, food feasts here in Hamburg, but um, I created my own personal uh, little local food feast here at home and and. It was uh, really, really uh, nice to to see everyone coming together and such great support. Um, the special episode that we did had had a nice reach. Um, so just on uh, podcast listens alone, we we're already uh, within that thirty day period. We we're well over sixty thousand listens um for the podcast and then uh, and then for the video portion was quite a bit so it was absolutely nice that uh, people were really rallying and, and i think there and this really brings me to the first question uh, of uh, how all that went as people seem to be 
a lot more in flux and ready um, because of what was going on around the world, not just Black Lives Matters and Asian racism and the climate problems that we're, we're facing, but also the pandemic and COVID-19 and, and things that were, people were really looking for some solid direction and some solid answers. And they were feeling this dis-ease at our world and some of the systems that we're seeing in our world. And so they were um, really looking for things, some, some new ways that might work better. And so uh, you've been doing this for, I think, going on 45 years now, right? Um, That's right. My, it is 45 <laughs> years. Yeah. Well, yeah, quite yeah. some time. And so I, I want to know, um, one, how have you weathered this crazy time? But more importantly, has your model, the economics of happiness, local economies, you know, World Localization Day, you're really trying to bring the economies back home, local to these community food webs. And uh, has it proven to be a better model for life? Has it proven to make you happier? Have it, has it proven to help you weather these storms of craziness better? It definitely has, but the evidence is, you know, in millions, literally millions of hands spread across the world without the funding and without the sort of centralized organizing bodies to do the research. I mean, we, we would be in a position to do that, but we would need vastly more funding. You know, if we had a, a proper budget to do the research and to document more, that would be a huge help. And, and also, I'm, what I'm seeing is that most of this work, which is happening from the bottom up, most of it uh, led by women um, and often out of a sort of embodied deep knowing, a deep connection to nature, a deep connection to community, which makes these women say, I am, this is crazy. I'm not going along with it anymore. So they have been sort of the leaders and making all of that visible, showing the statistics is, is happening and they are there, but we could do so much more if we had a fraction, but I mean like a millionth or even a one billionth of the funding of the dominant system which the dominant system is supported by essentially fake wealth. It's supported by the notion that global financial institutions and banks are allowed to create money out of thin air. You know, it has a long trajectory that, that goes back to the beginnings of this sort of European expansion across the world. So already in the 1400s and so on, banking started shifting towards fractional reserve and, and became something that wasn't quite what people thought it was. They weren't keeping our money in their vaults the way we thought, but they were making money out of, out of our savings. But this has reached a level of make-believe and of complete oblivion to what actually constitutes real wealth. So part of the picture is that, you know, we need to understand that the wealth creation that's going on now that makes, you know, Bill Gates and Elon Musk and Richard Branson, you know, put so much money in the hands of these individuals is connected to a, a corporate system that we need to understand as a system where money is being made literally out of thin air uh, part of the process was delinking money from gold reserves and later on from the dollar. So it has absolutely no grounding. And it, it is really a question of us waking up to the fact that we must take control of that, that there must be a democratic process determining what the value of currency is, who creates the money, who gets to spend it. This is part of the picture. But anyway, at the moment, the top-down corporate structure has almost infinite amounts of money with which to put out a dominant narrative. Um, and, and that narrative has always been to tell us that it's good for us to keep moving away from nature, to keep handing over power to centralized institutions, to move into bigger and bigger urban centers, 
where we are completely removed from the land, from the resources, and have almost no power over our lives. We're dependent on centralized institutions, be they governments or, or business entities. So in that situation, the um, statistics we get that tell us, for instance, that the global food economy is necessary to feed the world and what now the UN is going to be putting out at a, a summit in September. They're being very cagey about the exact date, apparently, because they know there's so much opposition. But they'll be putting out the message that we need big centralized corporate structures and we need you know genetic engineering and now we need robots linked to drones to monitor and capture carbon this narrative is disastrous and it's going to be centralizing profits in fewer and fewer hands and it's going to continue to decimate the land the biodiversity the living soil the water, you know, the earthworms and the incredible richness of diversity that still exists on this planet. And all in the name of feeding the world, when actually the big monocultures promoted through this path actually produce less per acre of land, less per unit of water. The victory has been to destroy jobs, and allow people to be pushed into cities and then claim that this is progress. So um, yes, we are proving, we are showing and worldwide locally, I'm sorry, it's such a long answer to the question. No, you're fine, but, that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, you know, we are seeing all around the world, the demonstration that small diversified farms, and I mean really small, many of them, are like you know even two acres can be unbelievably productive and there are you know one of my favorites is a farm in japan of about five acres where this farmer is proving that if japan would localize it could feed itself easily and he is producing but you know everything from grain to vegetables animals even even using some own made biodiesel for the small machinery he uses and in a this cyclical, systemic way, showing this flourishing diversity. And um, we are, you know, we are now seeing more and more environmental groups. And of course, also we're, we're beginning to see that social activists are beginning to realize that focusing on the food economy, on food justice, on food sovereignty on the right of people, regions, even nations to feed themselves is a central issue from both social justice points of view and from environmental points of view. So there is real progress there. And one of the most wonderful uh, things that's also happening, and I'm seeing it from you know, Ladakh and Bhutan, where I worked for many years, to California, to Africa, to you know, many parts of Asia and in America, that there are young people who now actually want to farm. And in many cases, they've grown up in the big cities, very often been trained to sit in front of the computer screen and do something that felt meaningless and tedious and denied the need of our bodies and souls to be more connected, both connected to nature and connected to one another. And so there's this exodus, it's a, it's a mini trend for sure. It's not, it's not billions of people who are leaving the cities yet, but there's certainly a micro trend. And it's, it's so encouraging also to see how many of these young people, if they are, linked to the local food movement. So they understand the need to establish a market that is closer to the farm. It doesn't always have to be geographically closer, but it has to be a market, a group of consumers who want to support this type of healthy, diversified, community-based agriculture. And when they do that, the work is enjoyable, the relationship with the people who love the food, who appreciate them, who understand 
that farmers really should have the respect that doctors and lawyers and engineers have. You know, producing healthy food and, and actually by doing so, increasing the health of the soil and the environment, lowering greenhouse gas emissions, reducing the need for plastic. All of this is like this win, win, win. And, and we should be, all of us should be aware of this local food system movement. We should all be supporting it. And yes, it, those diversified farms can produce even 10 times more per unit of land, sometimes even more than that, but it sounds so unbelievable. You know, people can't believe it. What they do need is more loving hands and care. So they also create more jobs. According to economists, that's a minus. In a world where we have an overabundance of people and a lot of people insecure in their livelihoods, a lot of unemployment, job-rich, productive, biodiverse, agroecological, localized food systems are just win, 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 win. Absolutely. So, I mean, there's a lot of things you touched upon there, and I want to go even deeper. So, first of all, I, I had a uh, another guest on, on, on my show, uh, Professor Matthias Wackernagel. He is the head of the Earth Overshoot Day and the Ecological Footprint, wrote the book, The Ecological Footprint, for about 35 years now. He is the one who every every year he, he tells us what the Earth Overshoot Day is, which was July 29th. And he um, says, you know, we're running a big Ponzi scheme. And that and that's really what, in, in essence, what you've said is true. Our current extractive economies, our current capitalist system is a big Ponzi scheme. It's printing something out of nothing. There's nothing to back it up. And it's... Um, pushing and pulling humanity in a very unnatural direction, uh, an unnatural direction from the basic resources of humanity, of what human beings need to survive and thrive. And so um, it's sometimes for those who um, lived in cities or haven't been, uh, had, a, had a big opportunity to see how food is made and produced or to be involved in that process, it seems like a foreign thing to um, for us to be talk, putting economies or talking about economic models or happiness in conjunction with food. But for me, it's really common sense. So uh, the most basic measurement of energy our world has is a caloric unit a, a measurement of energy is a calorie and i don't want you to count calories i could give a shit less about calorie counting and that but i want to tell you the basic need of humanity is food water so that we can regulate our body temperature and run our motor our our, our battery so to say of our human body is, is driven on on food and water and, and healthy, clean, natural food and water, not chemicals and pesticide heavy um, uh, products that are highly processed and, and unhealthy for us and unhealthy for our planet. And it, it would be like, I would never buy a cell phone and not know where I'm gonna charge the battery so that I can use it. I'd never buy a car and not know where I'm going to fuel it up in or charge the batteries so that I can drive it. And the same with the food for my body, which is giving me my survival. I would not put that into the hands of anyone else to say, oh, I'll, I'll leave it to Monsanto or Bayer or to Unilever or Nestle or whoever the, the crazy company or organization is out there to provide me with my battery source, my food, my sustenance, which, which uh, uh, is my vital need to live. And so um, that's why we're talking about food because it's the world's oldest, longest running, most successful economy our world's ever seen. It's called an agrarian society. It's not only the, the most successful, longest running um, 
economy in the world, but it's also the one that has the biggest impact on our environment and our health and human suffering. And so if we get it wrong, we're going to get it really wrong. And if we get it right, we're really going to have a model that's going to sustain humanity uh, indefinitely. And so that's kind of, I guess, why we're talking about it. Um, but, but I mean, that also lead ties into this transition. So your first few books, obviously, they're talking about, it's almost kind of like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. It's talking about fossil fuels. It's talking about chemicals. It's talking about farming. It's talking about how almost this ancient economy that provides infrastructure and stability for humanity to thrive and flourish and develop and, and to grow um, has been cor corrupted and taken into a, into a form of a commodity. And it's, it's really coming back in many directions uh, to bite not only our climate, our environment, but human health uh, and our survival. And, and that's been a tie for these 45 years for you continually, food, farming, um, agriculture, how we do it, where it comes from, it's in all of your books. Um, besides what I just touched upon as, as the basic need and battery, are there some other things of complexity, some other things in there that we might need to be aware of as well, how, how that ties into long-term economics of happiness? Very good, yes. I mean, uh, but also just want to add um, to the food side of things that many people aren't aware that it's been part of the dominant narrative that farming was where we went wrong. So there's been this widespread idea that the minute we started farming, we started destroying ourselves. Because what we've seen is this cover up of how indigenous cultures function for sometimes like the Aboriginal communities in Australia, something like 60,000 years. And in parts of Asia, many tens of thousands of years, we have been told that human beings, the minute they started farming, everything went wrong. No, it was when uh, the top-down structures and essentially a globalized system started shaping agriculture and on um, using force, slavery, genocide, forcing people away from producing a range of things for their needs in their own regions to produce on monocultures for export. You know, so the giant cotton plantations, the sugar plantations, the coffee plantations, through force, wealthy elites imposed that and out of that grew a system where global corporations could amass huge wealth by having on one side of the world cheap labor and on the other side of the world through the industrial process, creating a money system that allowed them to produce where labor was cheap and to sell where labor was paid better. So this is how giant global corporations became monopolistic even before the Second World War. And then after the Second World War, they came on the scene, often with the help of socialist governments, even like in Sweden. They brought in now lots of fossil fuels and machinery and, and basically using the same chemicals that had been used for the weapons to put onto the land, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, fertilizers, and driving off even more millions of people from the land, replacing them with machinery and chemicals. So this unhealthy agriculture linked to unhealthy urbanization. That's what we have to start looking at and how it's become even worse in this latest era of globalization from about the mid eighties. So as we started waking up to environmental issues because of Rachel Carson, the whole world knew that we needed changes in science to become more holistic to become more respectful of nature and nature's ways, nature's complexity. We couldn't just sit in a lab and produce some DDT that we thought would just nicely kill a few insects over here to suit our agricultural needs. But suddenly the world woke up to, wow, we've killed the birds over here and other part of, even on the other side of the world. So there's this complexity 
and infinite diversity. We need to be more humble. We need to be more holistic. So there were many departments at different universities that set up departments that wanted to be more interdisciplinary, more holistic. I was connected to some of those, also taught at one at the University of Berkeley. But I saw how this initiative, which came as it were from the people, got more and more co-opted as big business gained more and more power. And my experience is that many of the people in big business who helped the process of essentially co-opting the environmental movement and of you know, co-opting the food and farming movement weren't doing so out of ill will. They actually were people often in positions of you know, extreme power connected to the corporate system. And they became seriously concerned about the environment. But the thing that they weren't gonna be looking at was the economic trajectory that was all the time now, almost like a machine, supporting the big to get bigger. We essentially had global monopolies gaining more and more power. And they were doing that, particularly from the Second World War on, through trade treaties, where they were pressuring governments to give them more freedom. So the free trade was freedom for big corporations to move in and out of every economy and basically do as they please. And now we're at a stage where those uh, treaties have clauses that say to governments, if you do anything that hinders our profits in any way reduces our profit, we can take you to court and sue you. And these are kangaroo courts. I mean, it's crazy. The, the, really, the world needs to know about this because no self-respecting capitalist wants to support the hijacking uh, by monopolies of the democratic process. It's not a free market. And yeah, so anyway, we, um, we are seeing that with COVID, there has been a questioning of this globalizing process. There was a sense that, ooh, maybe it's a bit dangerous to be completely dependent on basic needs, the most basic being food, but we found with blue paper and you know other things that masks that countries weren't able to produce their own um, vaccines, you know now. So I think uh, we've seen a bit of an opening where even at the higher levels of power, there is a questioning of the continued globalization, but especially from the bottom up, um, we've seen. Uh, just a huge interest in COVID, especially of people beginning to plant a bit of their own food in their gardens, to start baking bread. And, you know, there was, we also saw in COVID that it was the local farmers markets and often the local restaurants that converted themselves into food hubs that were actually providing food for people, often while the supermarket shelves were empty. So we were seeing the resilience, so-called, the viability of more localized structures to provide for people's real needs. And we can see a huge increase in interest in localization. We see it also demonstrated by things like big business constantly trying to market itself as local. HSBC calls itself, you know, the world's local bank. And supermarkets now call themselves, you know, the local supermarket. So there's no doubt that people are wanting this. And what we need is to get out this systemic understanding so people are clear about what they need to support and not to fall for the, um, you know, the marketing and the, the green washing, the local washing that's going on. Um, I hope I answered your question. I think I might have stepped you, back as usual, but yeah. you definitely, you definitely did, and and I, 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 I think it's a multifaceted answer as well. And so, um, it, it's just really neat to see the journey. But it's also important that those of our listeners who maybe might not be as well versed that kind of get get a deeper look inside um, to 
to this way of thinking. Um, I, I, you're going to be writing a contribution for, for my book, Menu B. There's about 42 plus other contributors and authors um, um, who are contributing to it as well. It's about global food systems reformation and how we can bring local food um, webs back, which, which are really um, infrastructures, which are really a key economies, uh, key to fixing and, and, and helping uh, places all over the world. Ken Meter is uh, also an author who's contributing. He wrote this book called Building Community Food Webs. And it's really something that you said as well, um, that in some areas we're producing, let's take, for example, potatoes. We're exporting these potatoes, but then the same amount of potatoes we're exporting, we're importing that same amount from thousands of kilometers across the world. Um, we're, we're doing that with, with uh, beef and, and um, animal products. We're doing it with fruits and vegetables. We're doing it for, for bottled water, for God's sake. And in, and in Sweden and in the Nordic uh, regions, we're doing it sometimes with fish. We're taking fish and sending it somewhere else to be washed, cleaned, and cut, and maybe frozen, and then shipped right back to the place very close to where it was caught, caught to then be con consumed. And uh, these are, are, are systems that are have a limit to growth. Uh, it, it's not a good business model. It's a, not a good capitalistic model that you can turn a food into a commodity and think that it's somehow cheaper to, to get a cucumber from thousands of miles away than the one right next door uh, uh, and the minerals, the vitamins, and the footprint is totally, uh, totally off on those. But yet you can buy that cucumber for, you know, 10 cents or, or 20 cents, but uh, even though it traveled those thousands of miles. So there's this big factor missing in this whole equation. Total environmental cost as percentage of EBITDA, the true cost, the natural capital, so to say, but the, the one that has a big cost on human health, human suffering, and also on environmental impact as far as uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and, and, and many other things that, that go into our, to our world. And so as we kind of, uh, uh, we're obviously going to keep coming back to food and, and the multifaceted complex food webs and food systems that are involved in, in this complexity. Because that's just how it is. Uh, 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 our world is complex. It's made up of systems, and we need to embrace that. We're we're a multifaceted, complex being, an organism that that, that can deal. It, we're adept to deal with this complexity. The minute we dumb it down and put it into a silo or linear thinking and say, "No, we're only going to address just this one aspect of the food system," then we fail. Then the system breaks. You know. Um, and so I, I guess I, I, I want to, to go a little bit more into what does it mean to build these food webs, these local food economies, to build up an economy of happiness? What, what does that bring? What, what's the end result? Okay, well, I, okay, I'll get to that, but I also want to get, sure. to, get back to describing why they're so necessary. But what it brings is, first of all, um, we're seeing just example after example of just remarkable healing. So first of all, healthy, nutritious food, fresh food is the best medicine. And more and more people are realizing that. They're realizing that the highly processed dead food, which comes from the other side of the world often, and often at this artificially lower price is costing us our health. The creation of trans fats was completely linked to the transportability that allows giants to accumulate more and more wealth and sell their products across the world. 
was you know, heating up fats until they're actually toxic for our bodies. High fructose corn syrup, another corporate invention that has proven disastrous you know, and created an epidemic of diabetes, which is also what some people are calling you know, the second pandemic. People you know, in America now are going to be dying younger than their parent generation because of diabetes and heart disease and obesity all linked to this food system of toxic, addictive calories, food that has also been created, not just as a commodity, but actually consciously to be addictive. Um, so we're, we're talking about something that has become quite toxic and if, you know, evil in the sense that we're, we're beginning to, you know, we can uncover, uh, plans on the part of big corporations to make sure that people are no longer making their own soup, for instance, because Campbell's is going to come in there and make the soups for them. And then again, putting additives in them that makes them far less healthy. And then you add to that that the tins are lined with plastic. And now we're finding that plastic is disastrous for our health. All of that plastic in packaging and in the tins and so on is there because of corporate needs, not our health needs. So once you start shortening the distances that food travels, once you start rebuilding these food webs, you're actually helping to create viable economic systems that are restoring our health and the health of the soil, the health of species of seeds and animals that are adapted to a particular climate, to a particular region. And as you start producing diverse products on a given piece of land, as a farmer, you're no longer in this total fear of losing everything. You know, if there's a drought, if there's a hailstorm, if there's wind, when you have diversity on the land, you're not going to be losing everything. But when you have monoculture, you're first of all creating something that's completely unnatural. So this again, the monocultures are structurally linked to the long distance global corporate system. And those monocultures are in and of themselves toxic and unnatural. What we're also seeing, which is so wonderful, is that as people start connecting to the farms. Now, sometimes it's just a group of consumers who go out and maybe help with harvesting maybe once a year, or even just go and visit the farmer whom they buy from in the local shop or at the farmer's market. But that connection is already incredibly healing. We're seeing examples of children loving to be connected in that way. We're seeing examples of torture victims, prisoners, depressed people healed by engaging, not just with nature, but with the productive activity of producing something as vital and important as food. So I think there's, a, there's an extra added element here that you're actually seeing the product of what you've done. You know, you planted this seed and then some months later, here's this, you know, big carrot or a whole head of lettuce. And you often, you often get the impression of, you know, getting something for nothing because you just planted this little seed and then you watered it a bit. And then there you have this amazing gift from nature. But on my take on it, having worked in indigenous culture is that this is also to do with recovering a way of being, a humanity that is how we evolved. We actually evolved much more closely to the land, much more close to food production and to community. And in these local food economies now, that's what's being restored. And by the way, um, I had this wonderful conversation with Gabor Mate as part of World Localization Day. And I was just thrilled to see that he completely affirms this very important message that we shouldn't see the techno-economic corporate path of progress 
as progress. We shouldn't see it as evolutionary. It's a really important thing that we step back and distinguish between cultural change and an evolutionary process that we can see as we look back, you know, human beings did evolve, they did change in these fundamental ways. But when we look at the last sort of um, 50 years, particularly, but, you know, even we can go back further and see that there's been a few hundred years of a trajectory of change where a few elites, starting in Europe, dominated the rest of the world and then use technology to subjugate both nature and people. And it's a minority group of people. These people were not more highly evolved. They were simply using a tool of very narrow focus, a type of science that was very narrowly linked to profit and to control. And that tool and those technologies that came from that are not part of an evolution. They're actually part of a particular group of people exploiting the majority of humanity. And our blindness to this in part is that we've been told, this is good for you, this is progress, this is evolution. Don't question it, don't step back and say, wait a minute, maybe this is a wrong turn. If we don't recognize that this is a wrong turn, what are we saying? Are we really saying that we're going to want to have, uh, you know, a handful of men owning the entire world and the rest of humanity, no voice, nothing to say, no role to play, no creativity, no, no nothing? That's the direction of this exploitative system, which benefits fewer and fewer and fewer and, and is to the you know, detriment of the vast majority of humanity. That is not evolutionary. That is not progress. So Gabo Marte was very clear also about the vital importance of intergenerational community. And you know, intergenerational community, what does that mean? Well, it means that the old and the young have more contact with each other, that we aren't so segregated into separate age groups. We aren't generally so segregated. And this was, for me, one of the big lessons from indigenous culture. I lived in a culture where the economy still allowed that to flourish. And I saw how when the tiny baby and the 80-year-old are connected deeply, how it creates a completely different identity for the young and for the old. First of all, for the young, it meant that there were so many hands to carry the baby. No one got tired, no one got fed up, no one was exhausted because the, the baby might be a bit ill and need to be held the entire time. In fact, it was just normal that the baby was on somebody's body the whole time. Now that is how we evolved. And I experienced living in a culture like that, that that created the happiest, healthiest people I had ever met. It created young people who had no need to prove themselves. They had all these eyes in the extended family and community, all knew their name, knew them as unique individuals. Paradoxically, in that community-based extended family way, individualism thrived. You were allowed to be just the way you were. There was no pressure to be different. There was no pressure to follow some image of, of a good looking film star and a, you know, a billionaire who's made all this money and you too, if you really follow your passion, you know, you too can become a billionaire. No need at all. You were just who you were. I, you know, it took me years speaking the language fluently, living with these people to realize that this is perhaps the biggest wealth of all. And this may be the, maybe the most important thing in terms of happiness is the, the deep acceptance of self by people older than you as you're growing up. So that the questioning, the self-doubt, the fear of not being loved, the fear of being rejected, 
it's just not there. So I had never ever encountered people who were as deeply confident, so deeply confident that the self wasn't an issue. The self wasn't something you had to protect and you had to prove that you were just as good as others or maybe even that you're better than others. No need. Um, so that probably is the foundation stone of happiness. And that came through that more connected way of being. Now I'm seeing in the new local, so that's the ancient indigenous local that I came to discover in, in Ladakh and also in Bhutan, these regions in the Himalayas that had not been colonized or not transformed uh, either through Christian missionaries. And people have been allowed to develop and to stay independent of this exploitative system. But now in the new local, which you will find all around the world, and I'm, you know, there are areas, you know, places like Portland and all sort of alternative areas in the US, and you'll find them in every country. And in those pockets, as people are consciously leaving big city, the big competitive, global, I'm going to be important path to search for happiness, to search for meaning. In those usually smaller cities, um, you can find it also in pockets of big cities, people are consciously choosing meaning and happiness. And that they are realizing more and more comes through connection, connection to others and connection to nature. And connection is built through the ability to be yourself, to be vulnerable, not to be perfect, not to pretend to be something other than what you are. It's that ability to start becoming more nakedly. And you know, you know it can be scary for Westerners to be that vulnerable, um, but people are discovering that. Um, and, and voices like Gabor Mata are very important in that discussion. Um, and part of it is also supported through nature connection. I think the connection to others is more of greater fundamental importance for the development of a healthy sense of self in, in the young. Um, but the connection to nature is of course vital too. And that includes the animals, the plants. I saw in the traditional indigenous that when young boys, for instance, cared for their siblings, cared for young newborn goats or calves or animals, that was very much part of developing their humanity as well. And that was again, part of that intergenerational taking responsibility for the younger, not being segregated into institutional camps. Um, so I see, you know, the dominant Western path really almost like a prison in which we are forcefully segregated and separated from one another and from nature. But in localization, in that whole movement, there is that conscious breaking down of those boundaries and breaking free to become human again, to regain what we all know deep inside, uh, what we all long for. And, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual connection we're talking about, meaning it goes beyond the material, it goes to our souls, to it nourishes something deep within us, which can best be described as our spiritual needs. There are so many wisdoms that you've uh, shared with us there, and I'm, I have to agree with what you said, as well as uh, what Gabor was was saying during World Localization Day and your discussions. Um, in, in all reality, I think uh, we have, we've been misled in, in many respects. So first and foremost, we've been misled to believe that the oil, coal, and gas, and automotive industry were the number one cause of human suffering and greenhouse gas emissions. Don't get me wrong, they're on the list. They're in the top 10. But the, the, the top five have to do with agriculture, food and beverages, human health, and, and uh, are tied to the energy source of food. Because 
we have not had an evolution in, in, in agriculture and the food industry. We're actually still stuck in the, the middle ages in many respects. You know, there have been, I can count them on one hand, probably five innovations in, in these industries and they've all been at an extreme detriment to human health and to our environment. We produce more food, yes but at a, at a much greater cost to human health and suffering and to environmental destruction. We waste more land, we waste more resources than ever before, just during the time of, of the pandemic. And um, we went from wasting globally 30% of everything we produce in the agriculture, food and beverage indu industries and seafood industries to wasting close to 45% globally of everything that we touch. And what, what many people misunderstand is that it's not just a 45% waste, it's an exponential waste. So not only do we waste that 45%, uh, that but we waste all the water, the resources, the time, the labor, the marketing, the transport, the emissions, that went into to make that. And then the top three ways we dispose of our food waste in the world is by first burying them in a landfill with dirt or the next is by burning them. And the, the last is by throwing them in our oceans. And the number one way by burying them in a landfill, whether it's in packaging or not, is an exponential waste. It's a, it's a hugely exponential waste. Because when you bury something in packaging or not, it aggregates, it ferments, it turns into methane. And methane is 85 times more effective at trapping heat and creating heat than CO2. And so now you've got an exponential waste on a planet of finite resources. And a lot of people, that's not, that's not clear. And so, I mean, what Gabor was saying as far as evolution in, in the food industry one, those five innovations uh, haven't been that groundbreaking at all. Um, one of them that most people might not understand was supposed to be a huge help for food waste and, and humanity was the microwave. And it's, it's created a ripple effect of people eating more than they should, eating worse food than they should. It's created a, a nice vehicle for highly processed foods and, and frozen foods to even make that industry worse. And um, it, it hasn't brought people more out into nature as actually put them more in front of the TV to consume more, or to eat more. And, and it's been a real negative among the other, the other four innovations. But I, I truly believe that industry, those all those industries are still stuck in, in the dark ages. And I, I have this saying, and, and I kind of want to, lead into a couple things with this. It's not about the brands of the future or the products of the future that will stop human suffering in our environmental impact. It's how we produce anything, whether it's food or agriculture or whether it's cars or computers or, or uh, clothing, it's how we produce those that will have the biggest impact on human health and our, envir and our environment. And that means if we do it without chemicals and pesticides and fossil fuels, without uh, unfair wages and unfair labor and extortion of, of, of human beings, and we stop using it as a control method for indigenous people or other people on our earth to use food, which is a human basic right to control others or to man manipulate the way that they think or the way they act um, through food is just a horrific travesty in my opinion. I also just wanna come back to one thing you said, you know, well, yes, we produce more food, but actually this is also a myth. You take any two bits of land, you know, a square meter or a square kilometer, and with diversity, you could always produce more. Over a year's time, you could get more food out of that, more biomass, of course, but you could get actually more food because once you try bringing together the you know, animals, trees, plants, vegetables, and so on, you're creating a system which overall will be more productive. However, no place on earth 
has ever been helped to focus on that type of diversification. Indigenous cultures had plenty of land, space. They didn't need to focus on, oh, how can we get more out of the land? You know, we're too many people. So they had an easy time and there was plenty there. And in the modern era, their focus has been through force on this monocultural, moving away from self-reliance to produce on bigger and bigger monocultures pushed by bigger and bigger corporate and, uh, and other business structures, also with the help of national governments. And so even in Scandinavia, there was the belief that yes, modern agriculture, wow, we can produce all this food with all this machinery and people won't have to do that work. Isn't this great? Not realizing that, that again, we have to come back to the fact that just as you were talking earlier, you know, the, the energy for the battery, you know, this is, you know, the food we eat is, is who we are. It's whether we have energy, vitality, whether we're happy, whether we're healthy and strong whether we're depressed or not, that has to do with the food we eat. You know, it's food, it's exercise, and it's peace of mind. You know, those are the medicine. So once we get that right, and, and it's being demonstrated that when we get it right, we are healing depression and addiction and all kinds of problems. So, but come back to very important fact that the monocultures do not produce more food. Giant supermarkets are not helping us to produce more food and to produce a diversity of food. They may look that way because in a supermarket, you can have a great diversity of food from around the world, but they are part of a system where the scale and the global nature of it means that they are promoting more and more monocultures. And that means every day, different varieties of seeds, of animals, you know, plants and animals of all kinds, the diversity is rapidly disappearing. So to put it simply, looking at the globalizing path, and you know, particularly at the food side of it, we're seeing that this path is anti-life. Because if you are destroying diversity, you are destroying the fundamental principle of life. And this is why we must shift towards a localizing path. Now, localizing is not an absolute, doesn't mean that you know everybody's gonna live in some tiny village with 10 people and has to live in an extended family or something, but it does mean that we've got to sort out those basics. When we sort out agriculture to restore and regenerate diversity. We're you know, bringing back productivity to the soil, we're bringing back health to the land, we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we're reducing toxic pesticides, fungicides, herbicides. We are reducing the need for plastic, we're reducing the need for transport. And with that huge reduction in the need for energy, when we do that, we are also taking care of the water. The water shortages and the imbalances were also climate change are completely connected to what's happening in agriculture. Once we start looking at healthy agriculture, we're also looking at the model for forestry and often the healthy agriculture is also linked to agroforestry. And what we want in fishery, forestry and farming across the board is diversification. And that means that we need more people instead of more machinery. We need to actually learn that we can harvest even in, in forest. Our only choice is not to bung up giant monocultures of trees and then come in with machinery to do clear cutting. That type of forestry produces wood that's useless and again, destroys the soil. And you know, it's, it, we must turn towards diversification. And there too, we must realize that the import and export of identical products, which is happening with wood and building materials as well. Once we start creating more cyclical, diversified economies, more localized economies, we're restoring 
the healthy food, healthy building material, healthy fiber for clothing. So all basic needs can be, start becoming part of productive, healthy economies that also provide much more meaningful and, and fun employment. And it's being demonstrated in the localization movement. So I... Um, I almost now tend to know, think it's yeah. more than, than, than a movement. I think it's a, it's a whole new economic model. It's a whole new system. And I, I think it's closely tied to ecological economics, which is truly the only form of economics that will sustain our world and give us resilience for generations and decades to come that uh, has the ability to get us back to that that point of nature and i, I want to touch upon a couple of things which really tie into uh, other other things that you discuss in, in 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 your economics of happiness and your localization and that is we have had more than 20 civilization frameworks in our in our world uh helena um, early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztecs, Mayas, the Greeks, the Romans, on and on, more than 20, and all but two of them collapsed and are no longer here because of environmental or ecological destruction. Um, and these were advanced civilizations with infrastructure and roads and innovations and all sorts of communication and networks and, 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 and very complex systems going on there, they're not here. And so now we go to the Parthenon or somewhere on vacation and take a selfie behind in front of the ruins. And we don't really realize that we're at, at, at the form or the, the verge of, of some kind of a collapse ourselves. Um, and, and there's this thing that you talk a, a, about a lot, and that, that's kind of why I wanted to pre-set it up a little bit with uh, uh, these civilizations that are no longer here. And I just don't think because we have electric vehicles or a smartphone and, and computer power that that's going to save us from, from a potential collapse. Um, I, I just don't believe it, that that technology has the power to do that um uh to, to, to save us from that but there is a, another factor in there that we've been disconnected from nature which is something that you discuss uh, about not only our bio biosphere our biome our biodiversity we had this huge disconnect and it really occurred <laughs> a long time ago where we got into this mode, um, Huxley and even before, of neoliberalism and neo-Darwinism, that it is natural selection, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive, severe competition, and that's the way our world works. Well, that's bullshit. That's not how our world works. Our world works exactly like Lynn Margulis, who set the whole entire scientific community on their head and says, we are a symbiotic planet. We work with symbiogenesis and, and the symbiosis that we work in collaboration and cooperation with other organism, microorganisms in our biome together for long-term survival. That one, one organism's waste is another one's fuel and, and that we are helping each other in this cyclical circle of life and it is not only the strong survive and and that neoliberalism that neo-darwinism has crept into capitalism has crept into all our structures a lot of our structures and it is a model that is set up with a limit to growth that is going to collapse if if we don't get this connection and the the reason we've been talking about food and harping about it and and talking is because the way to connect ourselves is to realize that we are a part of this symbiotic earth and that we are not on the top of the, the chain. And uh, uh, Daniel Christian Wall, who you've, you've spoken with and, and, and uh, met many times, he has this great saying, seva, to be in regenerative service to life, to be an integral part of this symbiotic earth 
and, and connected. And that's how we can regenerate and go far. Um, so I, I guess with that setup, I want to see your thoughts and feelings on that. And maybe we should even tickle a little bit more on this neoliberalism and Darwinism and, and that. Yeah. Well, definitely, you know, the entire economic trajectory from the outset through slavery, genocide, and later on colonialism, and then now in the modern era, neo-colonialism, globalization, has been based on this belief. First of all, the survival of the fittest, competition is the way we operate. And those scientists who tried to demonstrate, even going back, Lamarck and so on, who tried to demonstrate, well, actually, there is more cooperation in nature than there is competition. Those were silenced. And so the dominant part became more and more fundamentally the space in competition and this constant sort of propaganda that this path of progress was, as I said earlier, somehow naturally an, an evolutionary path that we couldn't question. And all the time, you know, the message came, this is good for you, you know, this is progress. With you. you know, you're away from the land now in the city, you're so much happier, you're so much better off. Why are you complaining? You have everything, you know, you've got a modern house, you've got, why are you unhappy? And I see a lot of that still in the West, a lot of people feeling very guilty about a sense of deep loss, a deep sadness, because they're told you have everything. What are you complaining about? And they haven't understood that, no, you've actually been robbed of those deep, meaningful connections. You've been robbed of time. People are running faster and faster to keep up with this competitive machine and this sense that you're no good the way you are. You've got to improve and you've got to be more beautiful. You've got to be more successful. You've got to be more wealthy and just running, running to stay in place. So people are told that this system is only there because they wanted it and they pushed for it. I'm seeing something very different. I'm seeing people pushed into it by an almost machine-like yeah, Darwinian system that, that started you know, to, you know, in, in some ways you have to go back 500 years to look at the beginnings of this particular civilization, which is doomed to fail. And by the way, for our, you know, from my point of view, civilization is part of the problem. Civilizations have generally been the ones we get to hear about, and they were the expansionist groups that expanded beyond their own region to conquer others, grab their resources, amalgamate them, sometimes enslave others, and that path didn't work. What has worked in many parts of the world, and as we can see with many indigenous cultures, for tens upon tens of thousands of years, they were able to sustain themselves because they focused on caring for their resources. They were not out there to conquer and to expand and keep growing and think that they could impose their way on diversity. So the path forward is a humility, is a respect for diversity, is respect for the other, is an understanding that nurturing and supporting many small is what can allow for the strength and life of the biosphere. It's that respect for diversity, human, cultural, individual human, as well as cultural diversity, and as well as the diversity of everything that lives. This is it's about slowing down, it's about scaling down, and in so doing, recognizing the richness we discover, the path of the competition, the fast pace, the getting ever bigger, and this type of growth leaves everything at a superficial level. As we rush through life and we don't get to know one another deeply, what becomes important is what you look like, what kind of a degree you have, what kind of a car you drive, not who you are. So it's only as we slow down and get to know each other that we come to appreciate each other for who we are. And we are then met 
And that need that we have to be loved for who we are on the inside is met. So this again comes back to a deep fundamental human need for deeper connection. And, and to, to, as I said, to feel appreciated for who we are, not what kind of car we drive, not what kind of PhD we might have, or you know how big our house is. So um, there was I something have, else I wanted to say. Yeah, go ahead. I have, I have a um, real because we're running close on time, but I have four four more questions for you that I'm okay. sure will will help spark what what else you wanted to say as well. Um, for those who are have, have been shaken awake or are now at a point in, in their lives where they can listen and they're um, can sense uh, that that they need to, they're looking for something they're looking for answers um world localization day localization movement and the economics of happiness is working your organization is working on a few few tools and things there's going to be a, a new uh, seven-minute local documentary out called Local, I guess, and and some action guides. But what would you say are the biggest tools that you know somebody new who who is like, boy, this is new to me, or I didn't know I was trapped into some kind of system, or I'm I'm looking for some some answers, and it seems overwhelming, seems very complex, seems like a lot of systems, seems big, I'm just a small person. Uh, what What is your advice? What are the tools that you've provided and what, what we have to look forward to coming on the horizon that you can, uh, you can give us as a little bit support? And, and is there some communities, some organizations like yours that we can go and get some support and, and have some discussions, get into conversations with people about more. Yeah, I think this is, first of all, is the number one thing that we recommend is that you try to identify a few like-minded people in the area where you live. And if right now in COVID, you can't get out there and meet personally, try to meet online, but ideally with the idea of people that are within reach so that you will be able to meet face to face. We're trying to encourage people to do that as number one priority. So that's the first step is connect. Connect with some like-minded people, anything from two to three to up to maybe 20 to form a bit of a group with whom you then explore more deeply this avenue of personal connection, but also you then start a process of what we're calling rethinking. We need to be rethinking some basic assumptions, as I've been saying, about progress, about what are our deeper needs, what makes us happy, why are things going so wrong, why, did we, why are we surrounded by this one crisis after another, where did this pandemic come from, is it linked to a corporate system that has been for a long time trashing our health and the environment and is there a way out of this that doesn't have to demonize any particular individuals any particular businesses any particular anything but really it's about a systemic shift and thank you also for saying this is not just about a localization movement it's a localization system it's a systems view of how can we operate in tune with the mandate of life. And that's the deep mandate in our own hearts as human beings, in our own bodies, in our own guts. And as someone like Zach Bush, the doctor will point out, you know, we're talking about the biome in our gut and the soil. This is now scientific fact that, you know, the microorganisms, the viruses and bacteria that we need in the soil, in our gut, are being killed off by this same monocultural system how do we rebuild those? How do we restore them? That's what localization is about. So it is, it's a system about coming in tune with life, including our life. So rethink together as a group. And as you do that, try to deepen that more vulnerable, open-hearted exchange with others so they can feel a deep connection. As people do that, they start gaining more 
joy, energy, and faith in life. They start gaining more hope. They start gaining uh, a sense that no, human beings aren't these greedy, nasty people who are destroying everything. It is not coming from human beings. It's coming from an inhuman machine-like grinding system that we have blindly supported. So the rethinking is that waking up so we don't support that anymore. And then we, we use the term resist and renew. Once you're clear about the need to resist further globalizing extermination of life, basically, and you want to affirm the localizing renewal of life, what are the things you want to resist and renew? And there are, we are putting out an action guide and we already on our website have lots of examples. We have a planet local series where we have examples of what's happening around the world. We have inspiring talks by the leaders in this movement because we have been the pioneers of this and we've been the only ones promoting localization from a global perspective and promoting it globally, interacting with groups around the world. So there our website is full of materials. And the final words we, we you know we say connect, rethink, resist, renew, and celebrate. And the celebration is very much this awakening to the richness and the joys of nature, to life. And that we also urge people to, you know, include the singing, dancing, and making music that indigenous cultures, most of them enjoyed as part of daily life. And the key in all of that too, was that it was a connected celebration. It wasn't spectator and and stars, you know, global stars and the rest just passive spectators. It was a community joint participatory celebration. So these are part of the sort of um, the sort of the systemic localizing part that we have been promoting for a long time has of course been very much informed by, entirely informed by really deep experience in a very healthy functioning indigenous society. And I just wanna to add to that too, that another part of this of course, is that this systemic shift is also about respect for women and the feminine. And, and maybe more important than women is the feminine, the feminine aspect, the nurturing aspect, the caring aspect, the, again, that deeply connecting aspect. So that again is um, you know, one of the reasons why it brings with it much joy and health because men have been encouraged to, you know, disown their feminine side. You know, women have been told that they were imperfect and inferior for their femininity. And this whole systemic shift we're talking about affirms that both in men and women, and also recognizes that there are fundamental differences in, in men and women that again, in our history, because we weren't polarized into caricatures of the sort of Rambo Barbie doll world, those, those polar opposites weren't exaggerated. We contained some of each in, in both. So there was a balance there that we are regaining. Um, and a lot more to say about that, you know, we could do a whole podcast on gender, particularly in the world today. But I think discussing that informed by experience in healthy indigenous cultures really is very valuable. Yeah, I mean, I, I really believe that there's a, not only is agriculture, seafood, food and beverage industries the biggest impact on human suffering, and um, our environment, but you touched upon it, this feminism, this empowering of, of women and girls, and uh, not only uh, the he for she, but the connection of what, what, what has been lost or what really this unrealized uh, potential that is creating huge amounts of suffering in our, in our world. And if we, if we could have multiple podcasts on this because it's such an important 
fix and, and, and a, a, such an important way to also draw down or repair, fix a lot of the problems that we're Absolutely. having. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, I'm, I'm t- in total alignment with you there. The hardest question I have for you today is really as short as possible as you can give me the answer. And I, I know that's always hard. <laughs> what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Well, it, it's, it's a multipolar world where cultural diversity flourishes and it flourishes because of a much deeper dialogue between the centers of the Western industrialized world and the billions of people who are still in what's called the global South, you know, in, the, in Africa, Asia and India. And there, this deeper dialogue now is so urgently needed because there's yeah, huge miscommunication, misinformation, and, and what constitutes poverty and what doesn't, how can we work together? So it's very much talking about the need for global collaboration and global deep discussion. What I was you know, talking about earlier, connecting at the local level is vital for our health and our strength, but we also need to be reaching out to have these global conversations in order to understand how can we jointly create a multipolar world that is genuinely more more decentralized, which means, again, where localized structures are allowed to flourish. And these, so that's that's the, um, the, that world would be one in which the languages that are almost extinct would actually be revitalized to the extent they can be a multipolar world where most people learn more than one language, but there isn't one dominant language. The the flourishing of diversity that we're seeing already through the movement of localization is so clearly how we have to go. As I say, that, that is life itself. And cultural diversity was a reflection of that biological diversity. So it is that multipolar, more decentralized, localized world. I love that. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about to look for ways to make a real impact? Let's say that they're already in this movement and and they're kind of new, um, but they want they really want to do something. They want to leave their mark. They want to ha- they want to help. They want to uh, change what they're seeing around them. What can they do? Well, right now in COVID and so on, they're, they're going to get the most mileage out of doing things locally. And there, there's so much innovation and potential. It's already happening. Because as I said before, there has never, ever been a cultural attempt to diversify as much as possible, you know, within a context where monoculture has been imposed. So the revitalization of diversity, which extends not just to food, but to building material, to fiber, and even to how do we bring back the ceremonies, the celebrations, the cultural ways that restore that that joyous celebration of life. These things are happening, but very often people are a bit lost. You know, do we go back to trying to emulate what was there earlier? Do we try to borrow from another culture? Well, it's probably going to be a mix, but what is there are key elements in that, and and they come back to being far more natural, far more participatory, uh, far more about connection and collaboration rather than competition. So there's certain principles so they can join a very exciting movement and experiment locally but also inform themselves of what's going on globally so again come back to our website localfutures.org great and I, I could lot. I also say another sure. thing one more thing that I, I do want to stress is that part of the crucial work in this sort of rethinking area is what I call big picture activism. There's been a, 
a way in which through the help of, again, big business, we've been told to tell very narrow personal stories. We keep hearing it's through storytelling that people learn. They don't learn through information. Actually, we desperately need a type of information, big picture information, understanding better what's going on in terms of the whole trajectory of what's happening globally. So we need to sort of step back, take a deep breath, be willing to look at this global system from a global point of view. So we don't end up trapped in the theater of the type of left-right politics that isn't helping us at all, uh, but instead start looking at this systemic shift. So big picture activism requires quite a lot of, of holistic learning, you know, gathering of information and disseminating that information in a holistic way. So there's huge scope for creativity. You know, if you're, um, if you're a songwriter or if you like to write poetry or whatever, you can still link it to contributing to meaningful change in the world. Um, but there is this tendency for people to, to, you know, first of all, to believe, you know, people don't want to learn from information and we need to tell stories about particular people Got to be really, really careful that we don't narrow down too much so we don't see the big picture. And the information we're talking about, most people just haven't got. And then the other thing is that there's a tendency to say, oh, we don't need any more talking. We, you know, we just got to get on with the action, with the examples. No, we actually do need more talking, exactly as you and I are talking. We actually need far more big picture activism. In other words, that's sort of education as activism. And we need to put a lot more energy into how we can get that out creatively, since we have the media that is corporate owned, corporate run, and that doesn't want us to question in this big picture way. I love that you said that, and it's so important. Um, uh, there's this ten this tendency to give us the elevator pitch, the quick pitch, the sh TED talk, the short version, the yeah. story synopsis. And uh, that doesn't solve the world's problems. It doesn't solve human suffering. It doesn't give us there. We need this, this big history, this big picture, this holistic, this overview effect, this cosmic perspective of how all the systems are interacting and working together. Um, and no, we don't need to be a complete expert on that, but we need to have enough of that view, that big cosmic perspective, that big history perspective, so that we can, sorry to say it, call bullshit on some of these <laughs> quick pitch, linear, lateral, quick solutions that are actually getting, a, could get us into some, some bigger bigger traps down the road or into to, to more problems. And, and um, yeah, I. And I, I think know, part yeah, of that too, you know, ahead. another part of that is to be very careful to question the corporate Green New Deal, the, the top down Green New Deal, which is trying you know, to plaster the land with solar panels and and windmill farms to try to fuel this global economy where we're importing and exporting the same product. Why does the US export 1.4 billion tons of beef and then turn around import 1.4 billion tons of beef? If they didn't do that, you'd be massively reducing emissions and energy use. So we've got to be really careful of the Green New Deal that's trying to increase, yes, renewable energy, but on a massive scale, to keep fueling this inordinately wasteful system. And this now applies to trying to use robots and drones and so on in agriculture. And that's why this UN food system coming up, the, a big summit is being boycotted by hundreds of millions of people around the world. So stay tuned for that as well. And we in Local Futures will be collaborating in those alternative summits where the people from around the world grounded and speaking from experience are showing that there is a way forward. There is a way forward that works with nature and that works with the needs of people.
The last question is, is really what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? You say, boy, had I known that 45 years ago would be much further along today. Mm. It's a little bit different, but I, I, I was tempted when I wrote my book, Ancient Futures, which it did get out, you know, in some countries, like in South Korea, it was a bestseller and so on. But in the English speaking world, it didn't get out because I was too critical of this dominant Western part. And I was sort of aware that if I hadn't done that, because I had the biggest publisher, National Geographic, all very excited about my knowledge about Ladakh and so on. So I might have gone ahead with their encouragement to just talk about the amazing beauty and wonder of Ladakhi traditional culture without critiquing the Western model. It would have given me more of a platform. I knew it would, but I just felt, um, you know, convinced and as I am still today that if we don't understand that dominant system you know we're doomed so I don't know if I would have done differently I sometimes think maybe I should have done but but that's other than that I I was convinced um, in the beginning of the potential for more collaborative and happier ways of doing things you know because of the Ladakh experience, and that hasn't changed. I just, I just see all around me evidence of that. And I see also evidence that when people are trapped in the dominant system, there is deep, deep unhappiness. So I'm more motivated than ever to just try to get this message out. Elena, thank you so much for letting me inside of your ideas and my listeners. It's been a sheer pleasure. We could talk literally for hours. The subject matter that we have uh, needs to, we need to go into the depth and substance. We need to make sense and because it is complex, but we have the abilities and, and I really thank you for your time and, and, and to get, get, getting us deeper so that we can kind of get the solutions to, to get on the right side of history so that we can have that cosmic perspective to really create those desirable futures where uh, it is a world that works for everyone. Yeah. You know, what we should do is let's do another one where the action guide comes out. We, we'll have an action guide with about 500 actions people can take and then we could go deeper into those. I I'd would love, love that. that. I would love that. Thank you so much, much. Helena. Have a wonderful day and you take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.